I've got a couple of questions to begin with here. And you know, when, uh, the, when the preacher asks a question, it's hard to know, right? Is he just asking a rhetorical question or does he want a response? So I want a response. I'm going to ask you if you're, if you're willing to answer, just raise your hands in response, all right? If the answer is yes, you can just put up your hand, all right? Here's the question. I'm just wondering, how many of you who are here today would like to live in heaven someday? How many of you here... That's a pretty strong majority. All right. How many of you definitely plan to live in heaven someday? Just curious if that's the same crew. Because <laughs> I do. I, I cannot imagine a better place in the universe to be. But the Bible tells us that heaven is not a place that a person can just go to. Rather, it is a place to which a person has to be taken. That's why I think Jesus promised in John 14, 2 and 3, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And he didn't say, and just come on up and join me. He said, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So if we want to get to heaven, we have to wait for Jesus to come back to get us and take us there. That's how you get to heaven. So this, this hope, this dream, and this reality of heaven begins always with the second coming of Jesus, his physical return to the atmosphere of this earth. Now what about this second coming, or what we sometimes call the, the second advent? What about that? Do you look forward to it? Do you? Do you ever think about it much? Do you ever daydream about it? Do you ever try to imagine you know, what it will be like? Have you ever thought about that? From what the Bible tells us, there will be a whole lot of things going on all at once, all over the earth and in the air, a whole bunch of stuff happening. So when, if you do, when you think about the second coming, if you ever dream about it, let me ask you this. What part of the action, so to speak, do you tend to think about? What, what do you look forward to most? When you think about the second coming of Jesus, what is the, what is the, part, of the part of the process that your mind goes to? Is it being reunited with a dead loved one who has been resurrected? Is that, is that kind of where your mind goes? Is it seeing the wicked finally stop dead in their sinful tracks as the Lord's appearing fills them with awe and, and terror? Is that kind of something you think of? Is it seeing the angels fan out and then having one of them come specifically to you and realize that perhaps that angel has been watching over your life? Is that what you imagine? Is it seeing Jesus being able to finally just actually, literally look at God? Is it being lifted into the air and leaving this whole world and its trials and troubles behind. When you, when you imagine that time, what do you think about? Because all of those things I mentioned are important elements involved in the Lord's return. And I think our, our past experiences as well as our present circumstances probably influence which elements of the second coming we, we might tend to most focus on or look forward to. If I've just lost a loved one, I might, I might be thinking of that reunification. But I would like to suggest to you and to us today that Jesus Christ's coming is really about getting together. In fact, I would say that it is the ultimate get-together. So let's look in the Bible. If you've got one handy, find 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We just read a few moments ago from 1 Thessalonians, so if you had found that, you should be able to find 2 Thessalonians. comes right after it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want us to read the first two verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a letter written by Paul. It wasn't written with chapters and verses. That helps us find things. But it kind of makes sense that a new chapter begins at this point in the letter because Paul is kind of opening up a new subject here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. He wrote, Now, brethren... Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word 
or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Now, in Paul's previous letter, or at least a former letter to these Thessalonian Christians, these Christians in the city of Thessalonica, the the book in the Bible that we call 1 Thessalonians, Paul in that letter had explained what would happen to God's people when Jesus returned. He explained to them that both those who were alive and those who had died would be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. The scripture reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the brother Evans read for us earlier, that was part of his explanation to them to understand what was going to happen when Jesus comes back. And then if you read on in that letter, Paul went on in chapter 5 to encourage his readers to be ready and to be watching for Christ's return. And so now this is another letter written at some time later, what we call 2 Thessalonians, and here Paul again brings up the subject of Jesus' second coming again. And the reason he does so is apparently some people in the church there at Thessalonica, they were promoting the idea that the time for the Lord to come back had arrived, and in reaction to that, they were basically doing nothing. Uh, They had quit their regular work, quit their regular activities, and they were doing really nothing but stirring up unnecessary anxiety among the church members. They kind of took the position that, you know, well, Christ is coming back, so I don't have to do anything, which makes life difficult. So Paul is now going to address this problem by reminding the Thessalonians that there were certain things that needed to take place before Jesus came back. So he was saying to them, don't just go on pause in life. You need to keep living life while still waiting for Christ's return. He was warning them to not be deceived on this topic. But look at verse 1 again, chapter 2, verse 1. It's really just an introductory statement, and it's easy for us to just kind of pass over introductory statements because it's not the the meat of the issue. Look at verse 1 where he says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. You know, here in verse 1, Paul simply refers to the subject that he is about to address. It's just an introductory statement. And that subject is this, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Paul in that verse is not giving the Thessalonians any new information. He's simply stating what he knew they already knew about. It was just a, a, a statement of subject. But today I would like for us to pause and consider this kind of already known information that's mentioned in verse one. Sometimes it's good to stop and think about the verse. What does it mean for us as we contemplate and look forward to Jesus Christ's return today? I think there's some things we can take from it. Notice, first of all, that the words, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, those words refer to one subject. They are inseparable parts of one event. This was one thing. One part won't happen without the other part. The coming and the gathering happen just in that order. That's why I said that Christ's coming is really about getting together. The Lord's return means getting together, and it means getting together in two main ways. First of all, the second advent of Jesus is about getting together with him. That should seem kind of obvious, but it's true. It's about getting together with him. The primary focus of the second coming for us should be Jesus. Yes, I want to eat. Um, Eat. (laughs) No. Yes, I want to meet. That's why I should stick to my notes. You know, I want to meet grandma, I want to meet aunt, whoever. Yes, okay, that's nice, but the primary focus needs to be Jesus. He's the star of the show. He's the main attraction. Have you ever been to a circus? You visited the circus? Circuses aren't as common as they were in times past, but there's still circuses that go around. I've been to the circus, I don't know, two or three times, I guess, in my life. And if you've ever been to a circus, you may know how confusing, if not frustrating, it is if you're in the, you know, the main tent or the main auditorium or wherever they're doing the circus. You might know how frustrating it is to try to keep track of everything that is going on. Have you been to the circus? 
They, they never just have one ring. They've got a bunch of rings, and they've got stuff happening over here and stuff here and stuff here, and you're, you're watching that, and you're like, oh, I missed that, and oh, that looks amazing. It's kind of confusing. And, and I know, I guess the point is you're not supposed to get it all. We live in this world where everything flashes quickly all of the time and you multi-visual multi task with a thousand things going on. But I, I, I don't do that well. I'm like, whoa, I want to see that by itself. And everything else can wait. But with all of that amazing activity happening in each of the rings, sometimes I feel like if I'm at a circus, I'm missing more than I'm seeing. I feel like I'm, I'm missing out on so much. But then sometimes if you've been at a circus, there is the ringmaster, usually the guy with the top hat and the long tails and his jacket. And every once in a while, the ringmaster will draw the attention of the audience to focus on something special that's going to happen, some amazing thing that's going to happen always in the center ring. Ladies and gentlemen, may I draw your attention to the center ring? And you're like, oh, what's going to happen? in the center ring. What I'm saying to you is that if the second coming was a circus, Jesus would be featured in the center ring all the time. The side rings would hardly matter. Jesus would be the focus. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, Paul refers to being gathered together to him. Who is him? That him is Jesus. That's why Jesus comes back, to get his people so that they can be with him. He doesn't come just to have his angels kind of round us up like a herd of cattle, you know? There, now I've got you all together in one place. Angel Gabriel, lock the gate, make sure none of them get out. It's not, it's not a roundup. There's a huge difference between being just gathered together and being gathered together to him. That makes a whole new story. You see, I believe that the best part of the second advent, the best part of heaven, the best part of eternity will simply be to be with God. Having no more separation from him. If you love God, if you love Jesus, how can we even imagine what that's like to just be able to be with God? Nothing between, nothing to pull us away all of the time. It's an amazing hope. So here's a hypothetical question. What if Christ's coming only meant that you could be with God, the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit? What if that's all there was to it? You get to be with God forever. Would it be worth it? Would you still look forward to it in the same way? The same eager hope? Would you still long for it and dream for his coming? We know what the right answer is, but would you look forward to it in the same way? You know, I'm asking us to think about how important is God in your hopes and desires for eternity. Because if eternity is just about I'm sick of this world and I want to be back with my, my relatives, maybe there's more to it than that. I would like to suggest to you that if eternity only promised being with God, it would be worth it. It would be well worth it. It would be over the top worth it. It would be more than enough. Because there is nothing of more value in this universe than His love and His friendship and His presence what else could you want? But you know what? You don't have to drive yourself crazy thinking about a question or a scenario like that. Well, if it was just God, would I really still want it? You don't have to worry about that. Because the second advent is a package, thankfully, which includes even more than the central gift of God's ongoing presence. That's the core. That's the center of it. But there's, there's a bunch of other good stuff that comes with it as well. I think it will be, it'll be nice to just lift off and leave this tired old world behind. Won't that be nice? Man, I think it will be exciting to see the angels and, and kind of, you know, see what they look like and how do they move. I'm very interested to see that. And I'm sure that the reunion with family or friends who have been raised to life, man, that's going to be sweet for a lot of people, right? But my hunch is that the focus of God's people at that time is going to be riveted on Jesus. Sometimes I don't know if we think about Jesus so much when we think about the second coming, but I think that's where our focus is going to be. 
As I picture Christ coming, I don't see someone sitting down off in a corner for a long discussion with an angel. Well, tell me how this whole thing worked. When I think of maybe a couple who have been separated by death being reunited, I don't see them totally absorbed in one another. What I picture instead is them joyfully embracing and then with maybe an arm around each other turning to face the Lord. I think that's what's going to happen. Because, man, there is an eternity to talk with angels and find out tips on flying. You've got lots of time for that. There is an eternity to hear the experiences of family and friends. Tell me what happened after I died. There is an eternity to hear the Bible characters tell their stories. You know, listen to Adam and Eve and Joshua and Daniel and Ruth and Esther and Luke and Paul and all of these people. And I'm sure they'll have amazing stories that we'll want to listen to. But I, I just don't think that we'll be able to tear our attention away from Christ very much, especially at the beginning. I can't imagine, oh, Jesus, nice to see you. You know, I'd really like to talk to you, Peter. I don't think so. I don't think it's going to work that way. You know, when I was attending the seminary in Michigan, eons of time ago, it feels like to me, we live down in, you know, where our church's seminary is, the southwest corner of Michigan, Berrien Springs, Michigan, which is about two hours away from Chicago. And so while we were there, Sandra and I went to what was, what was then the brand new Comiskey Park to see the Chicago White Sox play. If you're not a sports person, the Chicago White Sox is a major league baseball team. They're my third favorite team. I liked them as a kid because I thought, you know, white socks, that's so funny. They're talking about what color their socks are, so I thought that was cool. So I liked the white socks. Well, it was probably partly because of the fact that we were sitting so far up that we had to, you know, duck when the airplanes flew by, like those were the seats that we were sitting in. It seems to me like we went there to watch the game, but I felt like, truthfully, I missed most of the game. Not because I was gazing into my wife's eyes. But the thing is, with baseball, like a lot of sports are active, right? There's a lot going on. Baseball is kind of a slow game. It's interesting. But it's, it's a little better than watching darts or something. But it's, it's, it's pretty slow. There's a lot of pauses in baseball. And there's enough pauses that, that I found that it's easy for a person to get distracted. At least I got distracted. You know, because first of all, there's all these interesting and in some cases quite unusual people around you. So I found that you kind of get watching these people or, or in some cases watching out for some of these people to see what they're doing. And then there is that wonderful scoreboard. We live in a digital world with, you know, digital screens in our face all the time. But still, those scoreboards, you know, very interesting. They entertain you on an ongoing basis. All kinds of information and statistics and replays and what I found would happen is sitting way up there, I would be like looking at the people and maybe looking at the planes to see if they're going to hit us and looking at the screen and all of a sudden you would hear the crack of the bat or I'd hear the crowd start to roar and you're like, oh yeah, I forgot, there's a game and I feel like I missed most of what happened. There's a game happening way down there. Somehow I kept losing track of the game. But the game was supposed to be the primary reason why I was there. Why go to the park, take all that time and effort, climb way up all those steps to go watch the game and not watch the game? And you know, when Jesus comes back, I think we know there's going to be a lot going on all around us. But I don't think it will be like being at the game. I don't think we'll lose track of the central focus, Jesus himself. I don't think it will be nearly as easy to be distracted when Jesus is right there. I think it will be like everyone having seats right in the dugout and Jesus will be front and center. You can't miss him. You can't take your eyes off of him. The second coming is primarily about getting together with Jesus, seeing him face to face. And that means that even if you're not blessed with Christian relatives to share the event, it's still going to be wonderful. You know, many of us think of our loved ones and we look forward to that reuniting, but, but some of us don't have any loved ones who have chosen Christ. And when we think about the second coming, it's not like, oh, I'm going to be reunited with, you know, this person, this person, this person, because most likely that's not going to be the case. 
So is this still a good event to look forward to? Yes, it is. It is. Because you'll be able to share it with your Lord. And I don't think there will be any disappointment in just meeting your Lord. The second part of the getting together involved with the Lord's return is getting together with others. And this should not be new or surprising kind of a concept to Christians because getting together with Jesus always, always involves getting together with others. Christianity is this vertical relationship with God that draws us into it and affects our horizontal relationship with others. And so just simply choosing to be a follower of Jesus Christ automatically makes you a part of God's family and right there, boom, you are connected with others, like it or not. Yes, the primary focus is on the relationship between you and God, but the fact is it's impossible to get close to God without ending up getting closer to others. You cannot do it. Those people are like, oh, I'm a very spiritual person. Me and God have a very close connection. I'm really, really tight with God. I have nothing to do with God's people or the church or anything like that, but me and God, we're, we got this close connection. You might be sincere, but you are out to lunch. I'm serious. You cannot be like all close to God and totally disconnected from people because God loves those people as much as he loves you. So when you're connected with God, it forces you to be in connection with others. That's the way it works. There's no little solo Christianity thing. It's true now and it will be true at Jesus Christ's coming. For now we have... The words of Hebrews 10, 25 that remind us that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Glad that you have not forsaken forsaken, forsaken that today. And sure enough, at the second coming, the Bible says that we are indeed gathered together. It's interesting to look at how Jesus described this. If you've got your Bible there again, Mark 13, verses 26 and 27. Look at the together aspect that Jesus described when he talked about his coming. uh, Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, beginning at verse 26. Jesus is telling them about the coming of the Son of Man. And look at what he says. Mark 13, verse 26. says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And look at this, and then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. I think it's interesting that Jesus could just like snatch us one at a time, in time, but he does it all together. Just think, this will be the first time ever that Jesus and the angels and all of the Lord's followers will be together in one place and in one time. That's never happened before. For the first time, everybody's there together. Up until Christ returns, space and time and sin keep us apart. But finally, everybody is brought together at that moment. Now, getting together with God, that should be great. No question about that. But what about all these other people that we're getting together with? You know, just who are they? I mean, yeah, I think we certainly look forward to being caught up to the Lord with our loved ones and friends. But I don't know, do you ever wonder just who all will be gathered together when Jesus comes? you ever think about that? Now, I realize that, you know, you didn't all have the advantage that I had and the choir had. At the beginning of the sermon, I asked some questions, and I asked you to raise your hands, and you didn't get to see the whole congregation like I did, but you probably looked around a little bit, and I'm going to ask you, when I asked those questions at the beginning of the sermon, did you see some of the people who put up their hands? I mean, come on, did you see some of the people who put up their hands? I mean, with their attitudes, some of them, you know them. Who are they trying to kid? Think you're going to be in heaven? Let's get serious here. You know some of the folks. They said they're going to be in heaven. Yeah, right. (laughs) You never know. Don't put up your hands. But do, do you ever have thoughts like that? Ever someone's talking about being in heaven and you're thinking, mm, I don't, not from what I can tell. <laughs> and I have to wonder, 
if we'll be surprised by who is gathered to Christ when he comes. In fact, I know we're going to be surprised because in Matthew chapter 7 and chapter 25, Jesus actually indicates, suggests that many of us will be surprised. And when I think about that, I wonder, who will it be? You know, will it be maybe less of us than we think who will be gathered together? Will it be more of us than we think who will be gathered together? I, I go back and forth. Or maybe it will just plain be different of us than we think who will be gathered together. The older I get, the less inclined I am to think that I have a good idea. I mean, I still have ideas, but, you know, who will be there and who won't? The second coming of Jesus is really about getting together. Primarily, it's a get-together with God, but secondarily, it's a get-together with others. So if that's really true, then if, if I really want to be involved in that ultimate get-together, it should affect relationships here and now. It's not just a future issue. It, it has something to say for us now. First of all, it should obviously have a practical effect on our relationship with God. It should help us see the need for our relationship with Him to continue to grow, to be stronger. Why? Because nothing else will really motivate us to keep looking for Christ's return and to be ready for Him as just that, that pure longing to, to, to want to be able to see Him, to just be able to want to be with Him. Yes, being weary of the sinful old world and wanting to be reunited with loved ones, those things are a motivator. They can help fan those flames of hope in us. But I don't know if they're the best long-term motivator. Like being weary of sin, you can get weary of being weary of sin. You can get kind of tired that your only hope is just to get away from something bad. And it's nice to look forward to being reunited with loved ones, but, but even that... I believe the best motivator, the best incentive is not those things in themselves. Most of all, we have to have a longing to be with God. I think that's the thing that can keep your hope driving forward towards that time. If it's not about God, then you're, you're more likely to get sidetracked. You know what? When I first suggested going to a White Sox game, my wife, my dear wife Sandra, was not the least bit interested. That's okay. I'm a husband. I know how to persevere. Because, you know, she had occasionally watched a little bit of baseball on TV, and she made this assumption that going to the game would probably be about as boring as she perceived watching a game on TV would be. Now, of course, I knew better and different, as is often the case, I might add. But, but she... I, I take a lot of license up here because I figure there's time, you know, before I have to face. <laughs> but the thing is, I had been to a couple of Blue Jays games back when I was in high school. Now, this is way back. This is the days before the Sky Dome. Do you know there were days before the Sky Dome? Blue Jays existed back then. That, that's, that's the last Blue Jays game I've been to. I mean, you know, back when it was Exhibition Park, I, I went to a game against the Kansas City Royals and I cheered for Kansas City. And I went to a game against the Boston Red Sox, my second favorite team, because Red Sox are cooler than White Sox. And that was an amazing game because they had a brawl. How often do you see a brawl in a baseball game? Like they charged the mound, everybody ran out, they had a great big fight, it was amazing video. I don't condone it, but it was, it was quite interesting to watch. So I knew, I knew that there's lots of other interesting stuff to fill in the time at a game because baseball can be slow. Besides, we could get the tickets, I can't remember if it was free or it was like almost free, which is a big motivator for me. There was some kind of a thing on a cereal box where if you, I bought the right kind of cereal and you cut it out and you call in and you could get these tickets like, maybe it was free or, or close to free. In fact, I even worked it out that going to watch the White Sox game became the way that we celebrated our anniversary. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Just relax, Sandra enjoyed it. All right, don't think what you're thinking about me right now. She enjoyed it, right? Right, that's the right answer, yes. <laughs> she particularly liked it. For some reason, she particularly took delight in the way the announcer said one of the players on the White Sox team. Sandra never before had a favorite baseball player, and as far as I can tell, never since has had a baseball player, but she particularly liked... Robin Ventura! See? <laughs> See? 
Was that a good anniversary experience or what? How many of you remember what you did in your anniversary 25 years ago? Look at that. Robin Ventura, this was not pre-planned. Thank you for coming through for me there. I don't know, the guy would always be, uh, next up is Robin Ventura, and she really liked that. So that became her little speck down there running around on the ground. I don't know, maybe we weren't that far up. See, Christ's coming is also free. And I think it's also gonna be far better than we expect. I think it's going to exceed, I believe it's gonna exceed our expectations. But the reality is if we don't get to know him, Frankly, if God seems kind of boring to you, if God seems kind of scary to you, then obviously you're not really going to be looking forward to him coming back. You're not going to want to go with him and be with him. Who wants to spend eternity with someone that you, you just find nauseatingly boring or frightening? So how do you get to know him better so you can look forward to this? It's pretty basic. You talk to him. You read in a Bible that you can comfortably understand about what he did and what he said and why he came the first time and what he was like. And, and you don't just read about that, but then you actually try it out. You try doing stuff. If he says, you know, this will make you happy and this will give you peace, you try it and you see how it will work. And that's, that's how you develop relationship with him and start to look forward to being with him. But realizing that the second coming is really about getting together should affect more than just our relationship with God. The fact that the Lord's return involves being gathered together should also set a tone for our relationships with one another, particularly with fellow disciples of Christ. You see, if we're really truly looking forward to Jesus coming back, that means that we're looking forward to being gathered together with the saints. But if we can't stand some of our Christian brothers and sisters down here, then how on earth, or maybe I should say, how in heaven are we going to be able to stomach being gathered together with them at Christ's coming and then being stuck with them for eternity? Does that sound like heaven? Sounds like hell, right? You know, how, if I think about that, it's challenging to me. And I guess, I don't know, maybe... Maybe you're like me. Maybe we somehow think that everything is just going to suddenly change when the Lord appears. And those pig-headed idiots will become acceptable to us finally. <laughs> Got to stick with them forever. What do you think? What do you think for that instant kind of miracle to happen? What's going to have to happen? Is God going to have to change them? Or, oh, that's brutal. Yeah, or is God going to have to change me? What kind of miracle is going to have to happen? Or is it really too late at that point? It's a sobering thought. In other words, if we won't be happy being with God's people, then probably God won't have us gathered with them to Him. God won't force us to be unhappy for all time. In Matthew 13, 24 to 30, you can read Jesus' parable about the wheat and the weeds. And in this parable, Jesus confirms that not everyone who claims to be a Christian is actually a true follower of him. However, the parable also points out very clearly that the job of separating the two, the wheat and the weeds, is left up to Jesus and the angels when he returns. That means that you and I need to be careful because we're not always sure just who we might be asked to spend eternity with. I would say better to spend an earthly lifetime with a few weeds than miss out on spending an eternity with the rest of the wheat, right? At the time of the ultimate get-together, Christ chooses who is gathered together to his side. We don't get to pick teams. And there's no option for ultimatums. Well, if you're going to take him, Lord, or you're going to take her, pff, I'm not coming. And you're right. Sadly, you'll be right. God will be like, okay, if you don't want to come, that's sad, but that's your choice. Do our relationships with others fit in the context of the second coming of Jesus and the gathering together to him? That's a challenging thing when we spend year after year together. Perhaps we could think about, or as we think about being gathered together with others, we would be wise to maybe individually ponder a couple of a very probing questions that Ellen White 
posed in the April 6, 1903 General Conference Bulletin. So representatives of the church over 100 years ago were coming together. And these questions were asked of them to think about, to put them in the frame of mind that they needed to be in. I think they're worth thinking about today. These are the questions. Number one, suppose that today Christ should appear in the clouds of heaven. Who would be ready to meet him? It's a serious question. And then the second one, Suppose we should be translated into the kingdom of heaven just as we are. Would we be prepared to unite with the saints of God, to live in harmony with the royal family, the children of the heavenly king? That's a challenging question for me to think about. If you all and me are going to be just like we are, hmm, okay with that? The neat thing is, As we grow in our relationship with Jesus, he helps us to become more like him. And that includes more like him in the way that we relate to others. So preparation for his coming automatically includes preparation for being gathered together to him. And that means that if we find that our relationships with our fellow believers tend to consistently be, you know, abrasive and rocky and rough, yeah, Jesus had some confrontations with religious people, But if it seems like you're always in confrontation with the saints, then maybe we need to take some time to assess our relationship with Christ. Because it just doesn't seem to match the future plans. The second coming of Jesus is really about getting together. Getting together with him. Getting together with his people. In fact, it's the ultimate get-together. Jesus will be there in the air. The angels will be there in the air. And I think we can choose for the first time or again today, to choose that we will be part of that group who are gathered together to be there in the air, to join all of those beings in the air because we're all invited. I hope that every person here will be there. I want us all to be gathered together. And I asked you at the beginning, you know, who wants to go live in heaven? How many of you intend and plan to go live in heaven? We're going to sing a closing hymn that's probably new to some of you, but it's a beautiful hymn that talks about that hope. We did it first service, and I want to do it again, just as a little way to to act out our beliefs. We sit here in our respective pews, all in our place. Many of you in your permanent place you've sat in so many times, it's, it's yours. But as we sing this song, if you want to be in heaven, if you want to be together with us in heaven... I'm going to invite you to come out into the aisles, come in the aisles in the balcony, kind of come together a little bit closer because that's really what it's about. It's about getting together. And as we sing, I'm going to invite you to come out and sing together as we sing about that hope. Look forward to that day. We don't meet at Willowdale. We meet together in heaven.